Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Our text for today is found in verses 1 through 7. Let's read through our text, beginning at verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration, when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is both the fourth Sunday of Advent as well as Christmas Eve. And the theme of this day is love. As we celebrate the greatest gift of love given to us in the baby in the manger the one through whom God's love would be demonstrated in the greatest possible way and through whom eternal life would be freely given to all who believe. Now the words in our text today are arguably the most well-known Christmas verses in Scripture. And while many things about the Christmas season rightly warm our hearts with all the familiar, well-loved sights and sounds and smells and traditions of the season, these words in our text, written by Luke, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, are not meant to simply warm our hearts, but are meant to surprise us. They're meant to astonish us at the incredible love of God and at the upside-down nature of His kingdom in the way it comes. For if we set aside the familiar for a moment and try to read these words with fresh eyes as though for the very first time we might capture afresh the wonder and the surprise that they are meant to impart. Because Really, when you think about it, who could have ever imagined or dreamed that God Himself would come like this? That He would be laid in an animal's feeding trough because there was no room for the one who made all things, no place for the one for whom all things are made and exist. It just doesn't seem right. But when we look at it carefully, we find the wisdom of God apparent in these words, in the way that God sent us the greatest gift of His love. Luke begins by providing us with the setting of the birth of Christ in verses 1 to 3 by saying that in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was the governor of Syria and all went to be registered, each to his own town. More important than the registration that these verses talk about is the contrast that's being made here in our text between two kings and two kingdoms. Mike McKinley helpfully explains that Luke's inclusion of Caesar Augustus' name is not necessary for him to communicate the details regarding when these things took place. Mentioning Quirinius in the next verse would suffice. Augustus was the most powerful man in the world, flattered by the Roman Senate as being the son of a god. The irony is palpable for those who know where Luke's narrative is heading. Jesus truly was the Son of the Most High, and He would reign on David's throne over an eternal kingdom that puts Augustus' empire to shame. The lowly circumstances of Jesus' birth show us that God's kingdom will come in ways that surprise and subvert our expectations about what true greatness and power look like. Before his incarnation, 
The Son of God was rich beyond anything that Augustus could have ever imagined. But for our sake, he stooped to be born not merely as a human, that would have been condescension enough, but as a powerless infant in a barn outside of an inn in an insignificant town. Jesus became low in order that we might inherit great spiritual treasure. That is the ultimate point of Luke's paradoxical contrast between Caesar Augustus and the baby king, Jesus. These opening words of our text explain how it is that a poor carpenter from Nazareth and his betrothed wife ended up making a 90-mile journey out of the way when she was ready to give birth to the small town of Bethlehem. It was because under the reign of the world's most powerful ruler, the first emperor of the Roman Empire, a man who ushered in a period known as the Pax Romana, or Roman peace, who was considered to be a savior, a lord, and even a god, and whose own birthday was declared to be a day of good news. This man made a decree for all the world to be registered, a registration which would have reminded everybody of their oppression. This registration was for the purpose of taxation. It was a flexing of his position, of his power, of his might, and of the fact that other nations and peoples were subject to him. And because he decreed it, people were set in motion to be registered. And yet by drawing this attention to Caesar Augustus, as he does, Luke is showing us how even the most powerful man in the world, who was considered to be a God, a Lord, a Savior, a man who brought peace to the world, that he was nothing more in this story than a pawn in the hand of God to bring Mary and Joseph to the place where he had declared centuries beforehand through the prophet Micah that his son would be born in Bethlehem. As powerful and as impressive as Caesar thought he was, and others thought he was. And though he likely never even knew that this child existed during his own lifetime, the baby born under the shadow of his great empire was actually the king of kings and lord of lords, the one true God, the one true Lord and Savior in the flesh, whose birth truly was a day of good news and declared to be so by an army of heaven's angels because this Savior came to bring real peace and everlasting peace to the world. And that would be peace with God. Not an earthly peace, but a heavenly peace. Not a temporary peace but a lasting one. The child would establish a kingdom and do so through serving, through suffering, and through dying in the place of His people. A kingdom that would be established in the hearts of His people. A kingdom that would endure forever and subvert empires even like Rome, such that Caesar would fade away in the books of history, but not Jesus Christ, who still loved and praised and worshipped and followed today by countless people. He is the Lord of history, and He is the light of the world. This is wonderfully encouraging for us who live, like Mary and Joseph, in an oppressive and difficult world, a world in which we often worry about the, decision of our, the decisions of our leaders and even suffer from them. Knowing that God is sovereign, that He can turn the hearts of kings according to His will, and that He watches over His Word in order to perform it, ought to bring believers the greatest comfort and encouragement. Because it means that no matter who's ruling the world today, the one who rules over all things hasn't changed. He hasn't retired or gone anywhere. 
He is for His people. And He is with His people. And greater is He who is in us than He who is in the world. He will watch over His Word in order to perform it in our lives today. Even in the circumstances of life that are difficult and that we don't always understand. Then, in verses 4 through 7, Luke continues the story and tells us that Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Once again, Luke points out the royal nature, the kingly nature of this child by drawing attention to the fact that the reason Joseph had to go to Bethlehem to be registered was not only because of the decree that Augustus made, but also because he was of the house and lineage of David. And though he was not the biological father of Jesus in adopting him, that lineage was conferred to him such that according to the flesh, Jesus Christ is a royal descendant of David. He's the one promised from of old who would rule on the throne of David over an everlasting kingdom. As we see in this text, this king is so unlike the kings of this world because this king doesn't come in a display of pomp, wealth, and power, but rather, as Leon Morris points out for us, everything points to poverty, obscurity, and even rejection that Mary wrapped the child herself points to a lonely birth, as well as there being no place for them in the inn. Now, we don't have to ascribe any ill will or ill intent to the innkeeper when it comes to there not being any room for them in the inn. Because with his census, Bethlehem was likely overcrowded with people who had come there to be registered as well. And because of Mary's very pregnant condition, it likely took them much longer to get there than others, resulting in the accommodations being filled up and taken, and there truly being no place left for them. And while nativity scenes are a very warm and comforting sight to us at this time of year, the original nativity scene would have been cold and uncomfortable. A place where no expecting mother would want to have to give birth, especially to her first child. And the last place that we would expect the Son of God to be born. But there's a beautiful lesson for us in this. As our Kent Hughes wonderfully expresses, in his commentary in this text, when he asks us to consider the implication of Christ's astounding capacity for sympathy and understanding. He uses an example that's very helpful, saying it's a fact that if you have two in-tune pianos in the same room and a note is struck on one, the same note will gently respond on the other piano, though it's not touched by another person's hand. This is called sympathetic resonance. He says Christ's instrument, His humanity, was like ours in every way except for sin. And when a chord is struck in the weakness of our human instrument, as it were, it resonates in His. There is no note of human experience that doesn't play in Christ's as well. As the writer of Hebrews said, we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with us in our weakness. He has an unequaled capacity for sympathy. 
It goes far beyond intellectual understanding. Jesus does not, does not just imagine how his children feel. He feels how they feel. We are all sometimes under incredible pressure. We may feel that no one understands, much less cares. But the truth is, any note we play, whether a melody or a dirge, or a minor key or a discordant note, has sympathetic resonance in the heart of Jesus Christ. If God, in His great sovereignty, could use the decree of a pagan emperor to cause His Son to be born in the exact place that He had foretold centuries before, then surely God, in His great sovereignty, could also cause His Son to be born in any place that He desired. which means that these circumstances in which he was born were chosen. These were according to God's will. This king did not come in the way that earthly kings do. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom. He was born in the lowest place in poverty, oppression, and rejection, by choice, to show that there is nowhere that God will not go in order to reach His people. He didn't come to elevate Himself, but to lift others up, up out of spiritual death, up out of captivity to sin and corruption, and up into the freedom of the forgiven sons and daughters of God. His birth demonstrates just how accessible and approachable God is. And so, yes, our God is sovereign, but He is also compassionate and humble. He comes low in order to serve His people and sympathizes with them in their weaknesses, feeling what they feel. He gives us every reason to trust His loving heart towards us. This King and His kingdom are just so upside down. Because in Him we don't see, as we so often do in others, the love of power. And the love of having others beneath you. In Him we see the power of love. And one who bows low to lift others up because He loves to do so. And in this way, we see what true strength actually is. What true power is. He can humble himself in this greatest way. He can come in the lowest possible way. And yet not lose one ounce of his great glory. But actually, in doing so, his glory is made known to us in all its beauty. Because he comes low. Only He could humble Himself in this way, taking on weakness and His strength be seen through that weakness. As He succeeds where we fail. As He accomplishes what all humanity combined could not accomplish. He's the only one who lived a sinless life of perfect obedience to God's righteous law. And He's the only one who would take the place of even His enemies not just by dying for them, but by bearing our sins on His own shoulders. Being cruelly mocked and treated. As He took the wrath of God that our sins deserve to save us from a just judgment that is due to us. For our rebellion. By taking on weakness, Christ has revealed His true strength. And in this way, the upside-down kingdom can set our fallen hearts and our broken lives right side up again. This is owing to the power of His love, which is our freedom. 
if we would but trust Him. Now the last part of the final verse in our text, which states that there was no place for them in the inn, it highlights something important about this baby's life. For as William Barclay points out, there was no room in the inn which was symbolic of what was going to happen to Jesus. That the only place where there was room for Him in the sinful and broken world was on a cross. Now, in His infinite knowledge and in His infinite wisdom, He knew that this was how He would be welcomed. And in His great sovereignty, God always has the power to accomplish His will and to bring it to pass. If He can move the hearts of kings, then surely He can move the hearts of innkeepers. Which means that the way that He came and the circumstances in which He came were chosen by God's will. The way that He lived, the way He endured humanity's sinful hostility, the way that He was rejected, the way that He died, were all by sovereign choice. He endured our sinful hostility and love to save us. In His great love for us, He has freely chosen to give us the greatest gift, which is Himself. And to provide us with the remedy from our greatest problem, which is our sin. So that our sins can be forgiven. And so that the God that we've spent so much time running from can become precious to us by a work of His grace in our hearts. As we begin to recognize who the real King is. As His kingdom is established in us by faith. And though we are weak we can find great comfort in knowing that ours is a king who sympathizes with us in our weakness. And he's already succeeded where we failed. And so we can trust him with our lives in our weakness because he has proved his love for us in the greatest possible way by giving his life for us. By already accomplishing all we could ever need for our salvation. And by promising that if we would but trust Him, He will be sure to bring it about in our lives. This is what Christmas is all about. The sovereign King of the universe choosing to come low and clothe Himself in weakness to show the power of His love so that being rejected in a world of sin where there's no room for Him, He could make room in our hearts by accomplishing our salvation. And so this Christmas, my prayer is that He would become more precious to our hearts. that our faith would grow and that His love would be reflected in our lives to the world around us because He is worthy and He is still King today. Let's pray.